Hello, and welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary. Uh, I am Shelby Marshall, and I am usually co-hosting the show with Arthur Bergeron, who is a local attorney here with uh, Myrick O'Connell. He practices elder law, but for those of you that have watched the show, you know that this show is not about elder law. It's about um, Arthur's friends, Frank and Mary. And Frank and Mary are fictional characters who live here in Westboro, and their goal is to live here and, and play and enjoy life here in Westboro and be buried in their backyard, although... We've never talked about that, whether or not that's legal or not. Maybe that's for another installment. Um, so um, during these times of COVID, Arthur and I have been providing a, bringing a weekly show to our audience uh, to keep them current on what's going on in the town and, and to continue to uh, create and foster you know, community connections. So we have a, an amazing guest on today. Um, Anthony Vaver, who is our local historian and archivist, and I'll allow him to introduce himself and tell us all about him. Uh, first of all, good morning, Anthony. Hi, how are you? Great. Um, so um, uh, the reason why he was invited on, and I guess I should back up and say Arthur's on vacation today, so it's not like you know he's off in the background and we're not allowing him to talk, but he's on a much-deserved vacation, and maybe we'll watch this in a couple days on the rerun, and, and uh, so... Um, but uh, I asked Anthony to come on today. Um, for many of you, uh, you may be familiar with or have heard that there's been some discussion about uh, the idea of changing our town seal in Westboro, specifically because it has a cotton gin on it. And um, uh, Anthony's going to tell us all about that, so I don't want to jump in. Um, but I, I think it's important anytime we talk about changing history, and, and this is something that the Board of Selectmen um, have heard about so far, and ultimately we'll probably go to town meeting. What needs to go to town meeting for uh, the for it to change? The voters, our legislative body, will ultimately determine that path. A, whether or not it should change, and B, what the design will be. Um, but I think before we sort of we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I think it's important that we understand history in its context, and so that's why uh, Anthony's on TV. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelby. Yeah, so so let's just kind of jump into it. You you recently um, posted some information on Facebook, which I found fascinating. It was provided history and context of our seal. So tell us about you know what, how long have town seals been around? What's the history of it? What's the purpose of it? Sure, I will. I, I, I'm going to start off just. Um, if I could back up just a second, um, because my title is a local history librarian. And so I'm not really, I don't consider myself a town historian. Sorry. Um, certainly, well, that's fine. And this happens all the time. Um, <laughs> I, you know, even though I consider myself a cultural historian, I really haven't devoted my scholarly efforts in, like, say, to Westboro in particular, in the way that, say, Chris Allen or Phil Kittredge and some of the other um, town historians, I consider them, you know. Okay. To, or in, into that. Um, being a librarian, I'm the kind of person who directs people to that information. And so certainly as I do that, I'm picking up a lot about Westboro history. And so- um, That's uh, an important it's, distinction. Thank you for making that because I wasn't aware of that. So in our, I think it's important. All the time. Yeah, and, right. and so, uh, but the reason why that's significant is because as you were saying is that I've been getting some questions um, since this controversy arose about um, the town seal. And so I had opportunity to do a little, little research and to figure out and answer some of those questions. So um, so basically it comes, the way that I see it in terms of framing the, uh, uh, the issue of the town seal comes down to three issues. One is the town seal itself and its history and why we even have a town seal. Um, then um, Eli Whitney and the cotton gin because that's why we're here talking about it, is that our town seal currently has a picture of um, Eli Whitney's cotton gin on it. And, um, and then finally, the role that uh, seals and symbols have um, and what, what, what's their purpose? Why do we have them in our, in our society? So those are kind of the three issues that I see uh, working um, at play here when we talk about our town seal. So I'll talk a little bit about the the town seal itself. In 1899, the General Court of Massachusetts mandated um, that every town and city in Massachusetts had to have a seal. Um, 
I'm not exactly sure why that was the case. Uh, they decided that this was so important. I don't know if it was like the design lobby or something that got in there and said, uh, we need more, <laughs> more business. Um, but anyway, uh, so in 1899, all towns had to uh, design and have a, a seal. And so um, uh, in 1913 was the first time that I saw the town seal being used in Westboro's annual town report. So I'm gonna share that with you right now. Um, this is when we wait for, there we go, perfect. Yep. Okay, so that's the, uh, that was the very first uh, town seal that we, uh, that we had here in Westboro. And um, as you can see, it's uh, pretty generic. Um, it, it has a, um, you know, to our modern eyes, it's kind of an antique feel to it. It's a little Victorian. Um, and so, uh, but that was our town seal up until 1967. And uh, so I'm going to go just stop sharing that. Um, so in 1967 was, that was the uh, 250th anniversary of our, um, of our town and uh, the celebration. And so they decided as a part of that celebration that they would actually um, change the town seal. So they had uh, the, uh, the anniversary uh, commission asked art students from the Westboro High School to uh, submit ideas uh, and designs for the new seal. And in the end, they decided that they were going to create a composite of um, of four designs. One of them was the, um, and here, why don't I put that up as well so we can all see what we're talking about here. Yep, there So it is. one of them was the uh, the tower on the town hall. Um, another was the, um, the outline of uh, the Westboro map that proclaims us as the 100th town in Massachusetts. Um, the third is a pie crust that goes around the uh, the periphery of the town seal. And then, of course, the um, Eli Whitney's um, cotton gin. And so they decided to put those all together onto one of the uh, uh, to, to create a, a town seal. Um, and that appeared on the cover of the commemorative booklet for that um, uh, uh, for that anniversary, but also at the very, on the back of that booklet, they also, I'm going to, um, put another, well, they I had another that, design. Um, I understand that this was part of the 200 sound celebration. Was it formally adopted by the town through the town meeting process at that time? Do we know that? Oh gosh, I haven't, I haven't really looked through that. I'm assuming okay. that it, that it did. Yeah, uh, but I guess for, that, that's a follow-up item for all of us. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, so, so what I'm sharing now, do you see the, yes. the picture? So that was um, on the the back of the commemorative um, booklet, and that was also as part of the design. It must have been submitted as well. And so they actually created a commemorative coin that had the town seal and then this picture um, on the back of that coin. And so um, we actually have one of those coins in the archives at the Westboro Public Library. And so once we open up again, if anybody's interested, I'd be more than happy to pull that out and to, to show it to folks. Um, and uh, so that became basically the uh, the seal for our for our town from that po that um, point forward. It was just meant as. Um, the, for whatever reason, the folks in 1967 decided that the seal that we had before wasn't wasn't doing it for them. And so they decided they were going to create a new one. And so that's the one that we have now. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here. So so then that brings us to Eli Whitney and um, in his relationship to Westboro and the, the history of the cotton gin. So Eli Whitney was born in Westboro on December 8th in 1765. And um, his mother was Betsy Fay, and she was one of the first straw hat producers here in Westboro. Um, and in fact, um, 
uh, Eli Whitney Jr. Uh, was um, so prolific at, or at an early age, he was he tinkered around a lot, and so he helped develop hat pins that uh, that helped her out with her with her business, and um, uh, he also. Uh, uh, tinkered around and produced uh, nails because I guess nails were in big supply or big need during the American Revolution. Um, and his father, Eli Whitney, senior, um, he was a mechanically inclined farmer. Um, his father was also very active in town. So um, he was a selectman. And um, so when I first came into this position and was going through the town documents, um, I saw Eli Whitney's name all over the place. And I got really excited thinking, oh, my gosh, this is uh, the Eli Whitney, the inventor. And it turns out that it's his father who is just so active. And um, and so his signature appears all over the place. Um, so Eli Whitney ended up leaving Westboro um, for good in 1789. Um, at the age of 23 to attend Yale College. And so uh, after he graduated from college, he moved down to Georgia and he received a patent for his cotton gin in 1794. Now, the reason why this cotton gin was so important is because the cotton that was grown in the South was a different kind of cotton that was grown um, over in India at the time, India was for the longest time had really dominated the cotton industry. And so, uh, but the cotton, the kind, and they had cotton gins well before Eli Whitney. Um, and so India had cotton gins and they would separate uh, the, the cotton from the seeds. Um, and, uh, the, but the problem was, that the, that the strain of cotton that was grown in the American South, the cotton clung to the seeds much more tightly than the Indian cotton. So the India uh, cotton gin was not able to separate those two. So when, uh, when Eli Whitney came up with his invention, suddenly um, that was able to separate the two. And so whereas it would take a full day for one person basically to separate the seeds uh, from one pound of cotton. Um, with his uh, device, basically the cotton in industry, it, it increased production by 4,900%. So I guess if you do the math, if you could do one pound of cotton in per day for, for one person, with his invention, you could do 4,900 uh, pounds of cotton in one day. And for, now that now it becomes more of a supply, we need to pick more cotton, exactly. right? To get it and and obviously man the machine, but now we need more cotton because we're able to do that much faster. That's right, and and there's a huge demand worldwide for cotton textiles, mm -hmm. um, and so now it's a it's a uh, it's a race to be able to produce as much cotton as they possibly could. Well, these cotton growers obviously relied on um, slaves on to uh, produce the cotton, to separate the cotton. And so the, um, uh, so it also increased and uh, spread slavery throughout um, the entire South um, at a pace that, whereas it was really beginning to start to wane at that time. Slavery was, was beginning to, as an economic system, not to be quite as successful as, um, uh, as one might think it could be, at least in the way the American economy was working and working towards industrialization. Mm -hmm. But with Eli Whitney's machine, uh, it now made slavery much more profitable and really ended up spreading it. And, and, and a need, problem. and a need. I mean, there was a there was a functional need not, you know, uh, to have individuals that could do the work, right? That's right. So, yeah. That's right. Well, it turns out that... Um, uh, even though Eli Whitney was um, a, a great inventor um, and tinkerer, um, that he wasn't a great, such a great businessman. Um, he and his partner decided that rather than sell cotton gins to directly to the uh, producers and the farmers to be able to separate the two, they decided to go with a model that was kind of like with um, grist mills um, or uh, wheat mills, where they would actually do the separating for the farmers. So they would take the cotton in, 
produce it and um, and make their money that way. Well, the problem is that the design of the cotton gin really is not that complicated. And so it um, so people were able to um, produce their own versions of it. And so they ended up using all their profits to um, fight patent infringement. <laughs> Piracy um, in its early days, right? Exactly, and uh, and they ended up going bankrupt as a result of that. So their their business went under. I think it was in 1797. So pretty pretty soon after the invention came out. Um, so Eli Whitney, uh, he also was known for developing the notion of um, interlocking parts for guns. Um, there's a little bit of controversy there because certainly the idea for that had existed before that time, but the um, uh, but he but I guess he was the one that was really credited credited for creating that idea and pr reproducing that idea on a, on a broad, broad scale, um, and the importance with that is that before that time period, guns were pretty much individually produced, which again, lots of time, but if you could produce each of those parts and you could take one part off and put the exact same part back into it, now you can produce a lot of guns and a lot of- Produce um, more, repair others, you know, many purposes. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So Eli Whitney died at the age of 59 in 1825, and he's buried in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, so- uh, from going through the whole history here, we can see that while he was uh, born in Westboro, we might say that his relationship to our town is somewhat tangential, maybe circumstantial, um, because certainly we didn't, our town really didn't have any strong connection to the cotton gin as an invention. Um, we were merely the place where where he was born. So, um, uh, so that's, you know, what it's worth. So that's, that's kind yep. of Eli Whitney's story. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> um, so, and, and interesting, because I was not aware of the, his uh, parents' connection to the town. So that's sort of, that, that's just a whole other piece of information I'm sure our viewers will find of interest. And, and certainly um, the Faye name continues even kind of presently um, through, you know, through families that are here today. So right. I think the other piece of this you were talking about is kind of our connection kind of to the role of uh, seals and symbols. That's right. That's right. And, you know, a lot of times, um, I think it's really important when we, we're talking about history that that we're, we'd be very, try to, History is very complicated, and so we want to be very precise in the kind of terms that we use. And very often, um, I hear when we're discussing symbols and monuments, like say, especially with some of the uh, um, controversy with the uh, Confederate monuments, mm -hmm. that uh, that the phrase that somehow we're erasing history by removing them, and. Um, and, and, but I think when we talk about history, we want to be very careful about what we're talking about, because history is actually a practice. It's not really a collection of events and dates. Um, so it's it's not merely a chronicling of, you know, events that happened in the past. And, um, and because our interpretation of those events are always being shaped by our ever-evolving perceptions over time. So as time goes on, we, we get a different framework for understanding that history. Um, we have uh, different kinds of research uh, comes up. If we think about the way that events happen in our lives, very often we're just reacting to events as they happen to us. Um, I mean, we know that for sure now with the, you know, with the coronavirus pandemic, right? Where suddenly we're scrambling and we're trying to make the best that we, you know, the best um, decisions that we can. Um, however, over time, we can then look back at those decisions and we get a better framework for understanding. So the irony is that the further away we actually get from an event and from away from under its shadow, we actually come to a better understanding of what the meaning of that event is. So because of that, our notions of what happens in history is always changing. It's never fossilizes into that kind of you know, stones thing of here's what happened in the past and we can't change it because well, we're and, all looking at it in a different kind of way. 
and that is what I hear, you know, even in my own personal conversations with folks as we talk about, you know, we'll use the Confederate statues as, as the example and, you know, the fear of erasing history by taking them down. And, and then the follow on comment that I've heard, you know, a hundred times and even thought myself of, well, of course, you know, that was then and we think differently now and the statue is, you know, you know, you sort of get wrapped up in maybe, maybe it's just symbolic. It was just them, but of course we wouldn't erect a Confederate statue now because we, we've learned from that. Yeah. Um, but, but it's interesting, you know, I love that, uh, you know, that we have a much better understanding and perspective the further we get from those historical events, right? Um, right. I even think about 9-11, right? So yeah. how we thought about that in those moments those immediate months, years, days from that event and how we think of that now and what has transpired even in terms of how we've treated people that, um, uh, you know, our Muslim Islamic, uh, you know, friends and brothers and sisters, um, very different perspective than, you know, kind of those, those immediate days following. So very, very complicated. And I, and I've never thought of history as a process. I gotta, I gotta think about that one. Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, so, so, you know, there are two things that come out of what you're saying where, and that's the public nature of these, right, is that we, we create monuments, we create symbols, and we put them in public places, you know, on parks and government documents and so on, because these symbols are meant to represent who we are, um, what we aspire to be, what we think of ourselves as a community, and we put them in public places to help remind us of the fact that um, that these are our values, that these are our shared values, um, and so there there can become times where those symbols and those in the you know in the public are no longer representing us because you know things change over time. They just they just do, and so but we actually have a mechanism in in place um, to be able to handle that kind of situation. And that mechanism is that we can take these symbols um, and we can put them in public cultural institutions. Namely, we have museums, we have libraries, we have archives. That's the purpose of them. And in fact, in you know, it doesn't even have to be a symbol. Anything that is important to our culture that no is no longer has a utilitarian purpose to it. What we do is we take those and we put them in our cultural institutions. I think Smithsonian, right? You know, Smithsonian. Oh my uh, God, World Public Library, yeah. right? Uh, and so that we can um, gain a better understanding of why we had those symbols up, what they served, and perhaps why they no longer do so. So once again, we're not we're not really erasing history here. We're actually engaging in history, and we actually have a practices and cultural places where we can put that history and and have it live on and not bury it um, and that is in our cultural institutions and that's part of that's why why it's important for us to have libraries and to have these kinds of spaces for us in the same way that it's really important for us to have these monuments and these symbols to remind us of who we are yeah and so I Yep. I want to just add on to that, just to your point about having spaces where people can go and, and appreciate it, study it, maybe touch it, feel it. Um, and the library, it's always, I always took it for granted. Okay, the town, any town has a library, whatever. But, you know, it's a free, welcome, public resource um, with that that you are free to go in and say, I really, I want to, I want to understand our Confederate history, and you are free to do that with all the privacy that you are entitled to do that, and the protection under that. And and there's, I don't know, it's kind of like that, like those really st strong roots, and you know, in kind of in our democracy, like to me, like when you walk through those doors, there's a freedom and a liberation of what you can explore and and uh, engage in, so. Right, and and I'd be remiss to say, that, uh, being a librarian, um, that, you know, if people are, um, have questions about this process or about the history or about um, any of these kinds of issues, um, that, uh, that they really should come to the library, that we have librarians, um, 
Um, I am there as well to uh, to help out and direct you to resources that can answer some of these questions. Um, that's why we're there, um, and and that's also part of our purpose. Yeah, no, and and I'm sure. And thank you for saying that because I think you know going into a library and being kind of looking through the stacks and the various media that's available and certainly our archives um, can be intimidating. So we should we should tap into great people like yourselves who have experience and can um, understand the initial question and press a little bit more. Like, what are you really looking for? What's your real question or questions? Right. That's right. And I, I've been trying my best to try to minimize that intimidation factor because I know that archives do because we have all these rules, right? Because <laughs> we're dealing with precious things. Right. Um, but I really, but th these things are really there for people to come and enjoy and to look at. And so if anybody is interested in, um, again, it's a little tough right now, right? Because yeah. we're all locked away. But <laughs> once we do open up um, and people can come in, um, to stop by uh, the local history um, spot. We call it the uh, Westboro Center for History and Culture um, in the Westboro Public Library, and it's uh, right past the circulation desk. So um, especially if I'm there, please pop in, uh, say hi. I'm, uh, I, I'm always thrilled when people come in and, um, I'm always, and love showing them around and showing all the neat stuff that we have uh, locked away there. Um, but certainly other librarians can also help you out if I'm not around when I'm in that room. Well, we've, we've been known to take Frank and Mary on the road. So I think you've given us an idea for, you know, once things are open again, um, to bring the show to the center, uh, to see it and, and understand what's there. Um, and clearly from, um, I, I, I know you in a number of different, uh, uh lights and venues, Anthony, and, um, you're um, clearly a happy, smiley uh, uh, guy and, and welcoming to everyone. So I'm so glad you came on. Um, I know I've learned a lot on this uh, program and uh, today, and uh, I'm sure our viewers have as well. So thank you for, for being our guest. Uh, well, thank you so much, Shelby, for uh, having me on here to talk about these things. All right. Well, we'll definitely have you back. All right. Thank you so much for watching today's installment of Frank and Mary, and we'll look forward to seeing you or you seeing us on the next show. Thanks. <laughs>